1.62. It is 12 o'clock and we will now get started for our summer internship lecture series. For those of you that are just joining for the first time, I'm Scott Kirk. I'm the manager of environmental compliance at the Savannah River site for Savannah River Remediation. And today we welcome our young summer interns to our second of five lectures that will address a variety of different topics related to the profession of health physics. Before we get started, though, please uh, mute your microphones, and we are recording uh, this presentation. So last week, we had the privilege of listening to Dr. John Till share his professional experience in performing dose reconstruction studies at the Hampton Reservation and other DOE sites across the country. Uh, Dr. Till was selected as a, uh, the 2020 recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award by the Health Physics Society. And I encourage all of our young interns and professionals uh, to, to join the Health Physics Society. It's an outstanding organization. Uh, it provides an excellent forum to both contribute and be mentored by some of the very best health physicists in our country, like Dr. Till and our other presenters in this lecture series. <clears throat> the Health Physics Society has shaped my professional career immensely. I served as a member and a chair of the, the Society's Legislation and Regulations Committee for almost 10 years. Back in 2005, I was requested by Dr. Ray Gelmet, who was then the president of the Health Physics Society, to convene a working group of experts to prepare a joint position statement that was titled, Congressional Action is Needed to Ensure Uniform Safety and Security Regulations for Certain Radioactive Materials. And this position statement was joint with the Organization of Agreement States. Uh, the purpose of the position statement was that soon after the terrorist attacks on the United States of September 11, 2001, there was a real growing concern for the need to have additional controls to prevent the use of radioactive materials in sources that could be used in a radiological dispersal device. With the position statement, we also marked changes to the Atomic Energy Act to include discrete sources of radium-226 and accelerator produced radioactive materials that would be subject to the authority of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it was neat, this, these requirements were, or this legislation was really needed to implement the International Atomic Energy Agency's conduct or code of conduct on the safety and security of radioactive uh, sources is re referred to mostly today as the code of conduct. The legislation created two new types of byproduct materials, 1183 and 1184 byproduct materials, like I said, that would be subject to the NRC's licensing and regulatory controls. At the time, we held, a, a, we held teleconferences with the commissioner's staff to discuss our proposed draft legislation at the request of the commissioners. The position statement and proposed legislation was distributed to members of Congress. During that summer, the legislation that we had helped um, prepare was incorporated into the Dirty Bomb Prevention Act of 2005, the Nuclear Security Act of 2005, and ultimately into Section 651 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 by then uh, Senators Hillary Clinton, Jim Enhoff of Oklahoma, and the late Pete Domenici of New Mexico. The legislation was approved by Congress and then sent to then President George W. Bush in August of 2005 for his signature. With enactment of this legislation, the United States became the first of 74 member states to enact legislation and promulgate regulations to better secure radioactive sources that could be used for malevolent purposes. Soon thereafter, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission implemented uh, or, or started to promulgate implementing regulations that were titled the Expanded Definition of Byproduct Materials. This effort by the Health Physics Society uh, greatly shaped my profession, professional life as a plenary member, and I encourage each of you to become a member. And if I can do anything to help, just please ask. Today, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for this week's presentation, who is uh, Margaret Severa of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. She will speak of the NRC's role in uh, protecting radioactive materials and sealed sources across the United States. Margaret is a project manager for both the health physics and physical protection at the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Her responsibilities have included integration of radiation safety and physical security for power reactors, spent fuel storage, fuel cycle facilities, transportation, and complex decommissioning facilities across the United States. Since 2005, her focus has been on radioactive materials in the civilian sector, in use, storage, and transport, as well as for cybersecurity activities related to such materials. Additionally, she provides her expertise as a dose assessment 
for the Incident Response Organization of the NRC, and she is an expert for Ask the Experts Features uh, for the Health Physics Society. Uh, Ms. Severa holds a bachelor's degree in both microbiology and chemistry and a master's degree in health physics, all from Colorado State University. With that, we welcome Marguerite. Okay, so I can assume everybody can hear me. Um, I think, Leslie, did you have anything to add about the cameras and mutes and stuff? Uh, no, just please mute your devices as you log on, and I'll, I'll just keep an eye on it just in case anybody unmutes, and I'll remute you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and share content, and then once you get done, uh, I'll try to field Q&A with uh, the hand-raising function of WebEx. Okay. So, okay. Um, so, like, wow, that's annoying. There's like the big screen in the middle. Hold on, let me try to minimize that. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> so, like Scott uh, said, my name is Margaret Cervera. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. It is really, truly an honor. Um, but I get to talk to you about the seemingly kind of less sexy part of all things nuclear, and that's regulation. So, yay! Um, so, it is true that regulation might seem kind of tame compared to some of the more technical talks you're going to get during this um, program or this symposium, um, especially given how cool it is to hear John Till talk about his experiences. I mean, I, I admit I was, um, I was in thrall. Um, but two main reasons come to my mind as really strong positives uh, for a career, e either in regulation or, or whatever. Um, the first is that all of us have to follow rules in life. So in order to do that, we first have to know what they are. Um, we have to know what they are and we have to understand them. And the second one is that a really wide breadth and depth of knowledge is beneficial for development and sustainability of a regulatory framework. So that is, I need to be able to, to competently utilize a wide variety of information, um, both technical and the even harder part, the political part, on a daily basis. So doing that can be both challenging and very enjoyable. So for this in presentation, I'll give you information about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who we are, what we do, um, talk about how we function and about the framework that we have for uh, safety and security of radioactive materials that exists for the civilian sector, so not the defense sector. Um, Scott mentioned last uh, week and then again uh, this morning, or today, that I gave this presentation recently to the National Academies of Sciences Nuclear and Radiation Studies Board. Um, that is largely true, although I have tweaked it for you. Um, they had asked me some very specific questions that uh, you guys don't need, really need to know today. Um, he also mentioned last week that this will largely be about disused radioactive sources. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about all radioactive materials, sealed and unsealed, and regardless of use status. So, on to the always exciting, hello, come on, there we go, um, the always exciting list of topics that I'll cover today, um, mostly an introduction to the NRC, what we do, what we don't do, rulemaking processes, how we figure out what we're going to do, and that's going to be uh, risk-based and risk-informed, so I'll have mostly security um, issues there, sources of information that we use to develop our regulatory basis and our assessments, and then uh, what the actual requirements are. So um, this is our uh, agency mission, so while you're reading that mission, I'll point out here um, that our mandate is neither to provide absolute safety or security, that is, we do not, our intent is not to provide uh, zero risk, but to provide for adequate protection, which allows uh, the United States to continue to derive societal benefit uh, from the use of radioactive materials. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC's authority, derives from the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended. Um, this is actually before either the NRC or the DOE even existed, and we were a, a singular agency, the Atomic Energy Commission. The NRC's authority includes occupational safety, physical security, transportation, and transfers of radioactive materials, among some other things. Our commission consists of an ideal of five commissioners, we do have five right now, who cannot represent the same political party. Um, they're appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate for staggered five-year terms. The president then selects one commissioner to be the chairman. 
The NRC is an independent agency of the executive branch, which I had to look up because I didn't know why that was important. Which means that while the commission members are appointed by the president and then confirmed by the Senate, the president has limited authority to remove a commissioner prior to the expiration of their term. So this system actually largely shields the NRC from huge political shifts that may affect cabinet offices um, like DOE, for example. The NRC is the independent regulatory authority for the civilian use of both nuclear and radioactive materials within the United States. However, we can choose to delegate some of our regulatory authority to the states via an agreement signed by the chairman of the commission and the governor of the relevant state. So, for example, South Carolina is an agreement state. This agreement state then takes over primary regulatory authority for certain activities within their state borders. But implementation and enforcement, um, oh, but the NRC and the agreement states coordinate to ensure consistent implementation and enforcement of, of all regulations nationwide. So there, uh, that is a map right now that shows in gray all the current agreement states and in purple the states that are overseen by the NRC directly. In the U.S., however, users have the primary responsibility for the safety and security of, of the radioactive material that's in their possession. Through the implementation of the safety and security programs that they develop in compliance with regulatory requirements, licensees ensure a robust, integrated safety and security program is in place for the radioactive materials that they possess um, based on their activities. Um, I have not included other types of licensees, such as waste disposal or power reactors in the number of specific licensees that I've, I've shown up here. Um, as today, I'm going to focus on what we would call materials facilities, and these are facilities that use radioactive materials for medical, academic, industrial, research, um, all sorts of other uses. But we do have regulatory authority over other types of facilities as well. So overall, we are a large regulatory program. If you consider the regulatory programs that uh, exist in countries in the rest of the world, um, or more accurately, I guess we're a set of regulatory programs and with authority for the radioactive materials facilities over about 19,300 specific licensees and about 31,000 general licensed device holders. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about what those mean. So I do have a link in here about uses of radioactive materials. Oh, I hate you. Okay, hang on just a sec. This worked when we did the test drive. Uh, hang on. So very often, um, to many in the U.S. and worldwide, the face, I would say, of anything associated with the terms radiation or nuclear um, is either a power reactor or, even worse, a mushroom cloud. Um, however, the less visible but more critical to the social construct of the United States and the rest of the world, um, or at least of the United States, are the estimated 2 million radioactive sources and devices that are in use domestically. So these two slides, which um, I did provide, present some of the uses of radioactive sealed sources in activity categories one through three. So Scott mentioned the Code of Conduct on the Safety and Security of Radioactive Sources. That um, includes within it a table of categories one, two, and three, and those are different thresholds of sources. So I'm going to show you a table about those a little bit later. But um, honestly, so this first one is category one. And then here are some in the category two and category three. So these two slides present some of those uses. But honestly, it's pretty hard to think of some aspect of our lives that's not somehow dependent on the use of a radioactive material or a device that uses it. So let me go back to the other one. Okay. So... Uh, this slide was really important for the National Academies, uh, just to make sure that they understood what it is that the NRC does, but often, very, often importantly, what it is that we don't do. So most importantly, the NRC's mission is to license and regulate the use of radioactive and nuclear materials, ensuring adequate protection of the public health and safety, promotion of the common defense and security, and protection of the environment. The regulations that a licensee must comply with, the pre-licensing, 
oversight enforcement processes of the NRC and the agreement states that we maintain, and the safety and security assessment processes all combined to ensure that we meet this mission. The NRC has regulatory authority over radioactive and nuclear materials used in the civilian sector. We do not have radio uh, regulatory authority over the operation of machine generators. So that authority rests with the state. So while our authority includes production of radioactive material, let's say fluorine 18 that's used in positron emission tomography or a PET, um, it does not extend to the accelerator that actually produces the fluorine 18. The accelerator is regulated by the relevant state that it's in. Similarly, the NRC does not regulate the sectors. So that is, for example, we don't regulate the practice of medicine or whether or not certain materials are used in research, diagnosis, or treatment, nor do we regulate the energy or construction sectors that may mandate specific measurement parameters that might even be based on various engineering codes such as uh, ASME or ASTM. Finally, the NRC is not a promotional entity. When the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, was divided by the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, the NRC retained the regulatory authority and DOE, Department of Energy, retained the promotional responsibility. Therefore, the promotion of any specific technology, nuclear or otherwise, is strictly outside of the role of a regulator. Um, the Commission, besides having the authority to, among other things, issue, inspect, and enforce regulation, also issues statements of policy on various topics. These topics are varied and span the large scope of the NRC's regulatory authority. Each topic, though, often explains issues that are not explicit in regulation, and so is a really great way to make expectations clear, both to the regulated community and to members of the public, um, telling them what it is that we expect. For radioactive materials, two of the most applicable and widely referenced have to do with maintaining a robust safety and security culture and ensuring the use of cesium-137 chloride sources remains safe and secure. So more information on those and all the other policy statements is readily available on NRC's public website, um, which you can get to from the QR code. Um, and then in the slide deck when we sent those, that's also a link. The safety culture policy statement makes clear the Commission's expectation that all individuals and organizations performing or overseeing regulated activities involving nuclear materials should take the necessary steps to promote a positive safety culture by fostering specific traits as they apply to their organizational environments. These nine traits are leadership demonstrating safety values and actions, problem identification and resolution, personal accountability, safe and secure work processes, continuous learning, maintaining an environment for raising concerns, effective communications, a respectful work environment, and a questioning attitude. The cesium chloride policy statement explains the secure use of these sources at the present, and which is usually in uh, blood irradiators or research irradiators, and states the commission readiness to respond with additional security requirements if needed should the domestic threat environment change. So our rulemaking process is pretty circular and yes, we go round and round. So uh, step one there, uh, you can read those. Um, so we can skip step one and issue orders to individuals, specific licensees and or entire classes of licensees. Uh, these can be issued very quickly and carry the same weight as a regulation, but this is not how NRC likes, likes to regulate, and it's as it is not deliberative nor transparent. As an example, immediately after September 11, 2001, the NRC began issuing orders to licensees of both NRC and agreement states to increase security. Today, those orders have largely been rescinded as security measures were incorporated into regulation via the processes that I'll explain now. Um, a rulemaking process can be pretty long. Uh, 10 CFR Part 37, a major new rule, which is how we uh, took the security orders that were issued to materials facilities and turned them into what we call generically applicable regulations. So that is, we didn't have to send the orders individually to every single licensee because they're published as a regulation, they apply to everybody. Um, that rule took us about five years to be published. 
another one year for NRC licensees to implement, and another year after that for agreement state licensees to implement. That additional delay for agreement states is so that the, each individual state can get the regulations through their legislative process. In that example, we had security orders in place until the regulation took effect, but not all new regulation is preceded by orders. So, and at the same time we're working on a regulation, we are also required to be working on guidance for licensees. So the second that the regulation goes into effect, a licensee knows exactly what we mean by the regulation and how to comply. And our, this guidance must be issued at the same time as the final rule. So the red circles that I've shown in the process there are explicit locations for commission direction. At any of these points, or at any other time for that matter, for, uh, for some specific reasons, we could be redirected or the rulemaking could be denied outright. The staff cannot revisit issues that have been adjudicated without explicit permission by the commission to do so. So that is like a child, um, like you know, if I'm a little kid, I go to mom and I say, can I, can I have this? and I don't get the answer I want, so I go to my aunt and I say, well, can I have this? Um, we cannot commission shop to try to get different answers or an answer that we like. There's also built-in locations for public and other stakeholder contribution, and I'll harken back to what John said last week about that. So transparency and involvement breeds trust for the regulated community and especially compliance. So if they have uh, the more input that they can give us, especially about operations, um, so that they understand what the regulation is and they know how to fit it to their daily operation, compliance will be better. We have a very involved base who provide us extremely useful comments and suggestions that we do incorporate into our rulemaking activities. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, Good regulation being focused on a desired measurable outcome leading to defined results without direction from the NRC regarding how those results are being are to be obtained. So at the NRC, regulatory activities focus on identifying performance measures that ensure adequate safety and security margin and offer incentive incentives to licensees to improve their programs without regulatory intervention. So the basic questions that we think about when we're um, thinking about regulation is what can go wrong, how likely is it to happen, and what are the potential consequences if it does? So in the skydiving example, and this comes from our public website, the regulation might impose a performance requirement or the desired outcome that the parachute must open above an altitude of 5,000 feet. However, the requirement would not specify exactly how that desired outcome must be achieved. So that is, the requirement would not mandate the use of a ripcord, an automatic activation device, or some other method of opening the parachute above 5,000 feet. We want uh, the licensees to do that themselves. So for security, a more relevant example is the case of a st stolen radiography camera. So using a risk-based approach, uh, we would might consider immediate restrictions or maybe elimination completely of uh, gamma radiography we, or any portable or mobile sources because of what could happen with a stolen source. But being risk informed means that we take into account this specific risk profile and then incorporate it into as much other information as we can gather, such as operational experience and the risks posed to workers or the implica implications of not conducting weld examinations on pipelines or construction like a bridge or an overpass um, that require using this method. Keeping in mind, of course, like I said in a previous slide, that there are standards that require examination and we don't regulate those sectors. So essentially the question comes down to should one risk, wherever it comes from, dominate a regulatory decision? So using all the information that we have available to us and considering our legal authorities, so you know we might want to do something but not have the authority to do it, then we determine prudent protection measures that are available today. We try to anticipate those that could be available tomorrow. And we contort them into something that's implementable, inspectable, and legally enforceable. And that's what we try to make our regulation be. 
So consider, for example, that we require vehicles that are used for storing radioactive materials to be immobilized. Um, so like that radiography truck on the left side. But other than specifying that removing the keys is not sufficient immobilization, we do not specify how that immobilization is to be accomplished. We leave it to the licensee to determine the best way for their operations and we make them demonstrate that capability on inspection. Um, do, do, do. So what kind of information do we use to make that informed and justified regulatory decision? So the NRC maintains close communications with the US intelligence community and is provided with information to allow us to maintain a national threat assessment for radioactive materials and the associated facilities and applicable design basis threats for other types of facilities. We collect and share licensee reporting of suspicious activities and events with other relevant federal agencies, noting that official event reporting is required for extremely low activity levels. So um, for an example, that uh, radiography camera example that I had on the previous slide, the reporting threshold for uh, Iridium-192 uh, if, a, if any amount of radioactive material is uh, lost or stolen or unaccounted for in some way, a licensee has to report it at, and I'm going to give you like SI units, 37 megabecquerels. But the category two threshold for, um, uh, for enhanced security is 0 0.8 terabecquerels. So a very significant difference of, I guess, for those of us who don't function in Becquerel's yet, um, the reporting threshold for Iridium is 1,000 microcuries, uh, but the actual CAT2 threshold is 21.6 curies. We also consider products of other U.S. agencies, including the National Academies of Sciences um, and international partners, including the IAEA. Obviously, we learned from historical events and both domestic and international operating experience, including events that don't involve radioactive or nuclear materials, but may be relevant. So um, one of the pictures that's on there is the bombing of the uh, Murrah building in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion about had, what, if that had incorporated uh, radioactive materials or if there had been radioactive materials in the building. Um, same with like the uh, Boston Marathon bombing. But we are also directly beholden to our mission and we answer to our stakeholders, including Congress and the Commission. So in addition to the information that we gather in the general course of business, when it comes to security and control of radioactive materials, some specific products are worth mentioning. So shortly after 9-11, the DOE and NRC worked together to conduct a risk assessment to determine what isotopes were of the highest concern in the United States. At about the same time, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, they were revising the code of conduct on the safety and security of radioactive sources. And now that uh, code had existed prior to 2001, but after 9-11 was being revised to kind of rethink uh, some security uh, scenarios. So part of this process was the revision and consideration of the categorization system, the ranking of sources in terms of their potential to cause harm to human health. Um, these and other products, uh, by the way, the um, DOE and NRC uh, RDD report is the one on the upper right-hand corner, and it is also publicly available. So these and other products came to similar conclusions, resulting in largely the same list of isotopes and agreement on quantity of radioactive material necessitating control at certain levels. To the NRC, all of this information helps us evaluate our regulatory framework so that we can sustain appropriate levels of protection. So in this case, that includes that category two is the appropriate threshold for enhanced protection as required by 10 CFR part 37. So I explained our mission and our processes, so now I'll get specific about those levels of protection. So broadly, the NRC has divided all radioactive material and associated uses into three groups. Uh, exempt material, the lowest level, these are low concentrations of radioactive material used by the public that poses no appreciable safety or security impact. So therefore, there are no requirements for users. Examples here are marine compasses that contain tritium gas, 
smoke detectors that you might have in your house that have americium-241, and some historic and antique items like watches containing radium-226. I actually own one of those uh, Revigator water um, jug things. Um, I don't drink out of it. The next group is the general license. This is for users of devices, largely for gauging and ionization, that are subject to limited requirements due to the inherent safety, um, like engineered safety features of the device itself. So these are, uh, think of these as gauges in um, any coal power plant will have them. Um, very often, um, like uh, I used to work at Anheuser-Busch when I was in, uh, grad school and we had them they were they measured fill lines and tanks and stuff like that um, users of generally licensed devices must report to the regulator any loss theft damage to and or malfunction of the device so that is like if the shutter or something fails to open or close or if the device falls off into a process line or something they must maintain records of leak tests conducted at least every six months or according to the manufacturer's specification. And the user cannot abandon the device, but they also have limited options for transferring the device uh, even to another user or for disposal. So they have to get permission from the regulator to do anything because they don't have a radiation safety program. These devices are designed to be suitable for, uses, uh, for use by users with no radiation safety program but who we depend on to maintain institutional control. And then finally, all radioactive material and devices that are neither exempt nor allowed under the general license are subject to the specific license. These licensees are subject to the basic radiation and worker protection regulations in 10 CFR parts 19, 20, and 21, and all other applicable regulations according to the continued graded approach um, applied to that level of control. So, and I'll talk about those a little bit more. I will also mention here that while we do have exempt and general licensed products and devices possessed by end users, the manufacture of items using or incorporating radioactive materials can only be done by a specific licensee. Within the specific license group, there are other layers of protection. So think of these as additional requirements as another step up the control grade. All specific licensees must meet the basic performance-based control measures for safety and security within their overall radiation protection program. So this is regardless of the amount of radioactive activity, the isotope, the modality of use, or any other number of possibilities, like where they are in the country, uh, the number of employees they have, um, even if they're an offshore oil uh, rig, drilling platform in the Gulf that we have authority over. For security, that is to secure from unauthorized removal or access materials in storage and to control and maintain constant surveillance of material that is not in storage. Additionally, portable gauges must be secured by two independent physical barriers whenever they're not under the direct control and constant surveillance of the licensee. So I'll give some examples in the next couple slides, but the onus is on the licensee um, or the applicant to, depending on where they are in the process, to give um, to describe their planned physical protection measures during the licensing process, and then if granted a license, if granted a license, to demonstrate in acceptable methods of security upon inspection. Also, while not security requirements explicitly, the reporting requirements that allow the main U NRC to maintain the U.S. National Registry of Radioactive Sources that's in our National Source Tracking System are contained within the basic radiation safety requirements, as are the reporting thresholds for events, uh, like I mentioned, for Iridium-192, including loss and theft. Additional control measures are required by, for licensees who have been grouped based on their modality of use, and those modalities may not be exclusive. So a hospital, for example, may be licensed both as a, as a broad scope research facility, but also as a medical facility, and thus must comply with both sets of additional requirements. This grouping allows for requirements that are uniquely applicable to the licensee's use. So some examples of requirements that provide a security benefit and are modality specific, um, for a uh, manufacturer or distributor, they're responsible for labeling and serialization of sealed sources and maintaining the QA and QC of that source documented in the safety evaluation for approved sealed source and devices, because only certain sealed sources and devices can be used in the United States. 
Industrial radiography can only conduct operations with a minimum of two qualified personnel. They have to maintain continuous direct visual surveillance of the operation to protect against unauthorized entry into their high radiation areas when they're conducting radiography. Um, medical facilities have to plan and balance their safety and security control measures, but with patient safety and confidentiality. They can't uh, leave doors open to watch patients, but they also can't lock doors and not be able to get to a patient. So they have to be very careful to balance that. Uh, well logging operations that are conducted for the energy sector, um, they have to conduct physical inventory of all of their sources every six months in, in addition to completing daily use logs. If a licensee of any type meets or exceeds the category two thresholds in 10 CFR part 37, again, I'll show you those in a second, um, which is roughly the, the same as the table that's include in included in IAEA's code of conduct, either within a single discrete source or by aggregating multiple lower activity sources, then they also have to implement the enhanced security of 10 CFR Part 37. Uh, Part 37 includes the additional physical protection measures that must be implemented during, including the development and maintenance of documented programs for background investigations and, author, and access authorizations. It's similar to a background check, but it's not, um, not like a DOE clearance or something like that. Uh, physical protection during use and storage, and then physical protection during transport. Um, I did not mention disused or not. So uh, in our within our regulatory framework, we don't distinguish between a source that is being used regularly and a source that's in storage because it's either not being used or not being used right now, waiting for something in the future. It all has to be protected. But even within Part 37, there are requirements for all Category 1 and 2 and additional requirements for Category 1. So another example there of the graded approach. So here's um, when I'm talking about all those applicable regulations in the presentation, I'm referring to these applicable to users of radioactive materials. So you'll see the different types. Um, uh, there's the broad scopes, industrial radiography, medical uses, irradiators, uh, well logging, all that kind of stuff individually. Um, and then I've just included this slide here for your reference, and then I have another link here. Is it going to work? No. <laughs> Hang on. So I promised that I would show you the table with the threshold. So here's all the um, part 37, and this table is largely similar to that in the Code of Conduct, includes all of these different isotopes at these thresholds that are very, very close. We are, um, the difference between our table and the one in the Code of Conduct is uh, a difference of sig significant figures. Um, and then anything that is Category 3 or lower and any other radioactive material is applicable in other portions of uh, regulation. So here's to the examples. So the first example is a radio pharmacy. They're licensed by the NRC under Part 30 for a specific license and Part 32 because they're a manufacturer or distributor of radio, of radio pharmaceuticals or radioactive materials. They're not considered a medical facility except that an authorized nuclear pharmacist, the requirements for them are in 10 CFR 35.55, which is our medical um, regulations. But it includes that, a, that the ANP must be a licensed pharmacist. Now, this is not an NRC license. This is likely a state license with additional training and experience as a nuclear pharmacist. They are also a shipper of radioactive materials and must comply with requirements for safe and secure transport, including using proper and certified packaging with appropriate labeling and placarding if applicable. So they have to comply with the transport requirements in 10 CFR Part 71, but they also have to comply with the Department of Transport transport requirements. Um, a radio pharmacy may only have small quantities of radioactive materials, but they are likely to have many isotopes in varying chemical and physical forms. So inspection focus areas will be identical to other types of facilities. So the inspection focus areas on the side, you're going to see again. But how they're inspected is, is specific to the facility type. So in this case, 
under the security focus, the inspector would examine access to the facility. So are there restricted areas? Um, if the facility or designated areas like a hot lab are limited access, who has keys to them? Who has access to the keys? Who's trained to work in those areas, including maybe um, uh, you know, the, the person who is doing housekeeping for the facility? Are there over-the-counter access points? So if somebody walks into the facility, and if so, how are they secured? Um, for the storage and control of materials, how are materials secured when not attended? Often those facilities will operate 24-7, but not necessarily, and um, certainly not, you know, if you think about like special weather events or, um, you know, uh, extraordinary weather events, hurricanes and fires and things. Uh, are materials attended when they're not secured or when they're in an unrestricted area? Uh, for receipt or transfer or inventory, who, when, and how do they receive material, like new generators, if you know about um, isotope generators, or returns from customers of, those ge of older generators? Um, who, when, and how do they verify a customer license before they transfer radioactive materials to them? For transport, do the drivers secure the radioactive materials at the point of drop-off? Do they stop for breaks? Are they allowed to stop for breaks? And how have they planned for vehicle accidents? Because Things like that happen. So the next example is a panoramic irradiator. So uh, a panoramic irradiator, uh, generally in the United States, they're using cobalt-60, lar very large amounts, um, like 3 million curies of cobalt-60 in a pool, uh, and product is uh, sent around the sources. The sources rise up out of the pool, and the product goes around the sources, uh, irradiating the product. So similar to a radio pharmacy, they're licensed under Part 30 for the specific license, but then under Part 36 for an irradiator. So Part 36 includes requirements for facility shielding so uh, and access control measures to prevent a person from being irradiated if they gain access to the vault. So um, these are, because of the extremely high radiation fields, it doesn't take very long to get uh, lethal doses if you were to enter the vault while the sources were up. So their um, access controls and uh, the facility shielding are integral to the design of the facility. But it also requires that personnel be on site when product is moving. So if any, nothing can get stuck while nobody's there to do something about it. Um, somebody also has to be there when the sources are exposed or if the sources are moving up and down in or in and out of the pool. An inspector in this case will look for access control. Do all the doors and entryways to the vault have adequate barriers to entry? Do the interlock systems function properly? Do the sources move automatically to a shielded position if the doors are open to the vault? Does detection of intrusion with sources uh, exposed cause the short, those sources to automatically fail safe? Does it initiate an audible and visible um, alarm to anybody who's in the area? And does it alert at least one other person who is trained and prepared to respond to such an occurrence? Additionally, for this example, the total aggregated quantity of radioactive material is likely, or I mean, it's going to uh, exceed the Category 1 threshold um, from the table that I showed you earlier, so Part 37 also applies. So therefore, the inspector will also examine, and this is not a complete list, Records of the access authorization program, including how licensees determined using their collected information, such as criminal history and background checks, that their personnel is trustworthy and reliable. They'll evaluate the facility security plan and selected procedures, including contingency plans for when the facility is being reloaded, so they have to load the sources because um, Cobalt-60 uh, um, decays per fairly quickly in an industrial sense. And um, uh, or when weather or some other event leads to a, a temporary closure of the facility um, or you know something where people can't get there, Th those facilities often run 24/7. The inspector will test their security systems to verify that the licensee can detect, assess, and respond to any unauthorized access. And because this is Category One. Um, they will also test that they can detect material leaving the security zone. So do they have radiation detectors um, that can detect the movement of the sources where they're not supposed to be? 
Additionally, the inspector will evaluate the licensee's processes and programs for securing sensitive information like their security plans or uh, information on the background checks of their employees. Finally, the inspector will verify that the licensee has established and maintains contact with their local law enforcement agency so that response will be informed and appropriate if and when it's needed. So uh, in conclusion, I just hope that I demonstrated that the NRC and the agreement states both have an established um, integrated safety and security program or requirements for all licensed radioactive material. We enforce it that way. And that it's commensurate with the safety and security risk associated with that material. But more importantly, I hope that I demonstrated that there's just a lot out there to think about. Um, what works for one facility doesn't necessarily work for another facility. So I mentioned that I worked for Anheuser-Busch. That's an extremely different type of facility than, say, a hospital or um, a university research lab. So uh, one set of requirements does not fit all in this case. And so we rely on a graded regulatory approach, but also consideration and, ex and lots of input from the licensed community to make sure that they can integrate safety and security protection measures to, um, that are custom to their facility. So that is it for me. Um, I've just given you some links to part 37, which is our part of regulation specifically, um, to the generic NRC public website, and then the radioactive material security. We have a little page that has all sorts of links and um, important places to get to there. So. I have no idea what time it is. I know I talk fast, so um, if there is anything um, from there, let's see. How do I expand this? Now? Uh, uh -huh. Hi, this yeah. is Scott. Can you hear me? I can. Hey, that was outstanding. It truly was. You know, I was really impressed with the comprehensiveness of it, how thorough the presentation was, but it also made me think about how far we have come since. 2005, that time frame. You know, the confirmatory orders went out to material licensees. You did a mm -hmm. comprehensive rulemaking under Part 37. That was done by all the agreement states. And the other part of it is is the complicating factor that material licensees are so diverse across the country, yeah. and some programs are more robust than others. And um, so you should be really proud of your work. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, all the information that you did with our interns and young professionals. Yeah. And, and so, with, and I would just, go ahead. the only other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, this was not where I thought that I would wind up as a health physicist. You know, that's one of those like accidental things. Um, my undergrad is in microbiology and chemistry, and I thought, uh, kind of ironically, in the current situation, that I was going to do vaccine research. Like, that was my thing. Wow. Um, and I worked with uh, um, my, um, leprosy and tuberculosis for years and really loved doing that and um, except that it, it just, you know, kind of discovered that that wasn't quite as fulfilling as I thought. And then I worked in biotech as a chemist. I was a bench chemist for years. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of did one of those things like lots of people do with health physics. I like tripped and fell and I didn't even know what health physics was when I went to grad school, honestly, I got laid off and went to grad school and became a health physicist and I didn't even know what it was. So um, yeah, you like never know where you're gonna wind up and what you're gonna wind up doing, but like, just do it, it's great. <laughs> well, the service that you provide to our nation is, is extraordinary. And I think not just about material licenses, but also the sealed sources that have been repatriated of US origin back to the US as part of DOE's Global Threat Reduction Initiative or the mm -hmm. off-site source recovery program. Right. Um, it's just a tremendous good work that you do for our country, so thank you. Yeah. So with that, we're gonna open it up to questions and answers. And um, Leslie Wooten and my staff is gonna guide through this part of the uh, presentation. Okay. All right, uh, everybody should be able to raise their hand. I already see uh, Thomas England Frank has his hand raised. So if anybody has questions, please try to use that function and then we can uh, go into just call in users who can't do that. Uh, so go ahead, Frank. Uh, hi, Frank England from Savannah Riverside. Um, the, um, I, in, in regulatory law for 
like RICRA, we describe the relationship between the states and the federal agency, EPA, as being delegation. I've heard Larry Camper point out that the relationship in NRC agreement states is not a delegation, it's something else. And I wondered if you could explain the practical difference um, with NRC agreement states. Is there concepts of overfile? Uh, what if their regulations are more severe uh, than NRC, et cetera? So I'm looking for the practical differences between being in an agreement state and being a RICRA delegate. Yeah, so I, I can't speak to how it's different from RICRA specifically because I don't know the answer to that. But I can tell you that um, I, I can't off the top of my head remember what the word is that we use for the agreement states. Um, relinquish. We relinquish our regulatory authority to the agreement states for the facilities, you know, for certain facilities within their uh, state borders. Um, but they, in order to to sign that agreement with the chairman, the state has to have compatible regulations and the NRC evaluates those compatible regulations and makes sure that they are compatible. But there are different levels of compatibility. So um, there are, I think there's four, A, B, C, and D. So um, depending every single line of regulation in 10 CFR, um, you know, the, the books that are ours, what is it like one to, one to 200, I think, are ours and the rest of them are DOE. Um, every single one of those has a compatibility category if it, it's going to apply to agreement states. So some of them have to, their regulations have to say exactly the same thing as NRCs do. In other cases, they're allowed to be more stringent. And usually that has to do with um, if that piece of regulation would not impede interstate commerce. So we still have to play um, you know, with the Commerce Department and make sure that we're not impeding in interstate commerce. So I mean, it's not a super specific example, but, um, but making sure that each state's regulations are compatible is something that we do when they're developing that agreement to become an agreement state, but also periodically. Um, we also have a program called IMPEP, the Integrated Materials Program Evaluation I uh, know I'm missing something. MPEP. So um, it's the program where the NRC uh, oversees the um, activities of the agreement states. So they're like basically under an inspection every five years to make sure that they maintain that compatibility. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Frank. Uh, let me scroll through. Uh, is there anybody with, with calling in, a call in user that has any questions? Go ahead and. Shout it out. <laughs> so this is Heavily Diggs. I kind of wanted to see if some of the interns had some questions, but Margaret, like you, I kind of went into nuclear engineering just completely separate and health physics completely separate <laughs> from what I had intended to go into for sure. Um, yeah. So just Kind of share with the interns, I think, um, maybe your perspective on, uh, I would say either probably like one of the most interesting um, uh, baby um, interfaces that you've had to do with maybe another country or um, some type of problem that you were trying to, you know, from a political standpoint to, to show how, you know, entangled um, this can, you know, the, the, what nuclear can become um, very politicized or, mm -hmm. or anything of, of, from a communication standpoint, where you think we might be able to improve our ability to communicate with the public on how great nuclear <laughs> uh, <laughs> resources can be, um, not just energy, but just nuclear in general, because uh, we've done a, we've done a poor job, unfortunately. So, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe with our Gen Z's, we can, um, we can have some inroads to the public. So um, this isn't <laughs> so sort of the his, Margaret's pet peeve. Okay. So here's Margaret's pet peeve. Um, and, and I think a lot of this, um, you know, there's a lot of political weight on both sides, and there's a lot of money 
involved oftentimes. And I think that complicates things. But here's Margaret's big pet peeve. So from a security standpoint, we have this um, balance that we have to maintain of uh, radioactive materials are extremely useful and help us maintain our social construct, not just in the US, but, but globally. However, at the same time, uh, there are those who would seek to use them for a malicious purpose, and we need to protect ourselves from that. Um, so, but getting that message correct so that it doesn't contort into anything radioactive or nuclear is automatically the worst thing in the entire world, and everything should go away. You know, there's that side of the argument. So we have to balance that with where the useful purposes are. On the other side of that, and I, I work, you know, some of the people who work in the waste disposal, like low-level waste folks are, you know, well, when I'm in the offices, they're on the other side of the cubicle from me. And so at the same time, we're telling people um, from a terrorism standpoint, anything radioactive and nuclear is the scariest thing in the world. We're also telling them, but it's okay to put a waste disposal facility in your community. And we can't have it both ways. <laughs> um, we, we cannot say anything, if anybody mentions cesium to you, you must run and hide and go away and cesium is the worst thing in the history of the world. And at the same time, tell somebody that it's okay to put a waste disposal facility, you know, 500 miles away from you um, because it's going to be safe and we can guarantee it's going to be safe for 10,000 years. W w ah, we can't do that. But there's a lot of money in both ways, right? There's a lot of money in securing things and there's a lot of money in wanting to dispose of stuff. Um, and very often those, those ideals just utterly clash and anybody who's talking about what's actually dangerous to somebody, you know, that's kind of a reasonable scientific base that just gets drowned out in the screaming and the, you know, trust me, this is fine and trust me, this is awful. So that's Margaret's pet peeve and it happens all around the world, everywhere. That's my big one. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I don't think I see anybody with the, the hand raise function up. Are there any other questions for Margaret? All right, last chance. Okay. <laughs> All right, if not, I'll hand things over to, to Scott for some closing statements. And thanks again, Margaret. That was a great Thank presentation. <laughs> All right, so this concludes our second of five presentations. I hope you guys, I know you enjoyed it. And next week, um, next Wednesday, this is Larry Camper, a retired uh, professional from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, we will be sharing information about radioactive waste management, which is a very good segue from Margaret's pet peeve, because we will address all of these issues. And again, thanks so much uh, for each of you guys for giving us your time today and participating in our lecture series. And with that, we'll turn it off. Thank you so much.